Welcome to the first Ethel Brown Harvey postdoctoral seminar of the new season. My name is Marta Echevarria, and I am the postdoc trainee representative on the Society of, for Developmental Biology Board of Directors. We have an exciting lineup of speakers in this 2024-2025 season, and we hope that you will join us throughout the year. To kick off today's seminar, I will turn it over to our first moderator, Ankita Tawani. Thank you, Martha, and welcome again to the Ethel Brown Harvey Postdoctoral Seminar Series. My name is Ankita Thawani. I'm a postdoc at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and we'll be moderating today with Konstantinos Calviotis, a postdoc at Francis Crick Institute. We're excited today to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members, and today we'll start the series with Dr. Sassen Ostvar, from Columbia University and Dr. Sarah Light from University of Notre Dame. They'll share their research. Each speaker will have 20 minute talk followed by a 10 minute of Q&A. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. Now to introduce our first speaker, Sasson. He got his master's and PhD at Oregon State University with Dr. Brian Wood. He did his postdoctoral training first at Harvard, then at Columbia. And since 2021, he has been working on morphogenesis of the early nervous system in Dr. Karen Kaza's lab in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in Columbia University. Throughout his career, which he's had a very productive career, he's contributed to 14 published works and three preprints across disciplines. And his main interests currently are biophysical basis of pattern formation and shape generation in living systems. And today he will tell us about his recent work on cell scale geometry and dynamics of neuroectodermal morphogenesis. All right, take it away, Sasson. Okay, sorry about that. Now it should work. All right, uh, thank you, Ankita, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to also thank the organizers for uh, this opportunity to uh, kick off this season of the Ethel Brown Harvey uh, postdoc seminar series. I'm really looking forward to the talks and to interacting with this fantastic community. And I'm especially delighted today to uh, present work that's developed out of uh, collaboration between the Kaiser Living Materials Lab at Columbia University and the Sutherland Lab at UVA. Uh, focused on understanding neuroepithelial tissue morphogenesis during early primary neurulation in mice. And to begin, I'd like to uh, pause on uh, how this work is kind of part of a broader ongoing effort uh, by our teams to leverage uh, advances in live imaging and computation uh, to study embryonic tissue uh, morphogenesis over uh, the sort of length scales and time scales that were probably not uh, accessible before in a tractable or quantitative way. And it's a particularly uh, exciting time for this kind of research uh, because these kinds of approaches and advances now allow us to ask questions about uh, how epithelial cells are shaped, uh, how they're organized in 3D space, and how their geometry evolves in time in response to short and long range instructions and mechanical cues during tissue scale movements. And highlighted here are uh, some of the length scales over which we might uh, approach such an analysis on a single cell, on single cell junctions, or on groups of cells undergoing collective movements or intercalations as seen here. And so if uh, geometry interests you, uh, Vertebrate primary neurulation is kind of a gift that keeps on giving. So this is a particularly rich morphogenetic movement uh, that can often be maybe challenging to access or quantify in its entirety, but has nonetheless been uh, studied with great fascination using the best available uh, imaging techniques and quantification techniques over decades. And now today we are kind of fortunate to be writing in the wake of major research advances in live imaging of whole embryos that make it possible to really study this process over time and with cellular resolution. As 
perhaps best demonstrated here by McDowell and colleagues using uh, a light sheet microscopy technique that was carefully customized and uh, you know tuned to adapt to the idiosyncrasies of the mouse embryo and the challenges that it poses for imaging. So in their work, uh, we can appreciate uh, these beautiful reconstructions that really highlight, uh, I think, the one of the defining features of mouse neural tube morphogenesis, which is uh, the composite deformations that the neurally faded ectoderm goes through to form the neural tube. So these include uh, kind of simultaneous furrowing and mediolateral folding that's accompanied by axial elongation by conversion extension, followed by coming together of the lateral folds that eventually fuse and shape the tube. And so this is a process that unfolds over a uh, fairly long time scale, depending on uh, what world you come from. And so the complexity of it kind of immediately prompts us to ask what kinds of cell shape changes or cell morphologies and what kind of nature of epithelial packing structure allows this rather uh, extreme deformation. And so this um, may or may not be kind of a challenging question uh, to approach for various reasons. So this is, uh, again, a tissue that has a uh, distinct structure along the neural axis. Uh, the timing of the deformations might vary uh, along the neural axis. And because this deformation uh, involves a folding component, it's inherently 3D. So some of the tools that are available for studying tissue mechanics in uh, cross-sectional uh, data or uh, planar cross-section through tissues may not be immediately applicable here. But there's, of course, a lot of hope and reasons to be excited. So uh, an illustrative example of a quantitative analysis on this tissue uh, was recently put forth by Brooks and colleagues who studied the cranial uh, mouse neuroplate. And uh, in their work, they were able to identify uh, collective kind of regional uh, cell shape changes that contributed to the elevation of the lateral folds in the cranial region, as uh, demonstrated here. And the kind of cell shape changes that they identified involved uh, apical constriction, as we can see here in uh, the heat maps of uh, apical cross-section of cell area on the right, and apical basal elongation. And I'd like to kind of pause on that last observation to uh, point out the fact that uh, seeing this out-of-plane deformation along the apical basal axis really highlights the fact that this is a three-dimensional deformation. And the apical basal axis is very much involved in the morphogenesis of this tissue so um, that kind of prompts us to want to really access uh, the structure of this, this tissue in 3D as much as possible to be able to understand uh, how the morphogenetic movement uh, unfolds in time. And so this brings us to uh, the focus for our work, which is on the other end of the neural axis in the sp spinal region. So here um, we have been interested in uh, following kind of the time evolution of uh, the 3D structure of the spinal mouse neural tube, uh, neural plate uh, epithelium over time, as demonstrated here in a um, movie that was taken of a one somite stage embryo. And so this data kind of by itself or through analysis that gives us uh, 3D reconstructions uh, immediately makes it apparent that uh, neuroepithelial cells are taller than they are wide, uh, with the majority of their contact area kind of uh, taken up by lateral contacts. And when we watch these movies, we can appreciate that uh, there are quite a few kind of localized deformations along the apical basal axis that proceed in a way that we don't necessarily expect or see in simple columnar epithelia. 
And so we can take this one step further and do uh, single cell tracking on these data sets uh, and study cell shapes uh, over different z-planes as kind of a first uh, approach to how cell shape is distributed in space. And here, again, we can see that uh, cross-sections along the z uh, direction of this tissue show us very different cell morphologies. Not only that, but uh, if we consider the uh, topology of the cell outline network, we can also see differences along the apical basal axis. And perhaps most interestingly, we can find various examples of groups of cells undergoing uh, distinct cell rearrangement events at the two extremes of this axis that might be asynchronous uh, or uh, driven as shown by Williams and colleagues by different kind of underlying mechanisms, namely contractile stresses versus uh, protrusive stresses at different positions along the cobasal axis. So these uh, last two observations especially bring us to uh, the questions that we're asking uh, in this work. Uh, the first one being, what are the morphologies and the cell packing structures that give us this sort of uh, neuro, typically neuro, neuro epithelial uh, sheet uh, tissue structure. So what do the cells look like? How do they pack together to form this tissue? And then beyond the static structure, uh, how do these uh, structures evolve? Uh, specifically, how do the cell-cell contacts evolve uh, during cell rearrangement events to uh, give the tissue its kind of dynamic nature. And so to effectively approach these questions in a quantitative way, uh, we needed uh, specific tools uh, that allow us to resolve uh, cell cell contacts uh, in space and time. So this was uh, work that was done in our lab by uh, Mia Lu, who really uh, solved the problem of having to deal with these kind of anisotropic voxel resolutions that we get from some of these imaging techniques. And they tend to really uh, limit how much you can do with existing reconstruction algorithms that uh, sometimes are really written for isotropic voxel resolutions or data that doesn't have this sort of uh, specific uh, kind of structure to it. And so uh, using this tool, we now uh, can not only access the uh, 3D cell shapes, uh, the topology of the cell outline network, but uh, actually isolate individual cell-cell contacts, track them over time, and watch their structures uh, evolve in time. And so before uh, we get to the results uh, or the kinds of results that we can get from this analysis, uh, I think it's very helpful to consider uh, the geometry of uh, the spinal mass neuroplate epithelium. Uh, so this is uh, shown here both in illustration, but also in a series of cross sections uh, that show the medial lateral kind of organization of the tissue at different uh, anterior posterior direction, uh, positions. And so immediately here, I think we can appreciate that this tissue is significantly curved, even at this very early stage. And uh, we can uh, take this one step further and actually measure uh, the curvature of the apical isosurface as shown here for uh, three different uh, posterior anterior positions. And these data, I think, clearly show that there's there's a prominent uh, curvature gradient uh, that's pre present throughout this axis, but also varies along this axis. And uh, in fact, if we take the peaks or the maxima of uh, this group of curves and plot it against the posterior anterior axis, we can see that there's almost a two-fold increase uh, in the center line curvature. OK, so now. What does this mean for cell morphology and how the tissue uh, is organized? Uh, that takes us to uh, the first part uh, of our analysis, which is focused on kind of measuring how many neighbor cells have and how these neighbors are organized in space. So um, I'd like to maybe go back here and also emphasize that 
uh, in this analysis, we were we were really interested in comparing uh, cells uh, along this uh, kind of prominent curvature gradient. So here um, we have identified two uh, cell populations, one that formed the median hinge point furrow and their lateral neighbors. And so the median hinge point furrow cells are uh, shown in orange and the lateral cells are shown in blue for the remainder of the study. And so let's first focus on what these two populations have in common. Uh, one thing that really distinguishes them is that they tend to have a lot of neighbors. So uh, this pseudo stratified character is really evident in this data. And this is not um, the sort of structure that we see in uh, simple columnar epithelial vessel. The other kind of uh, interesting morphological feature that we observe, is, uh, observe in these cells is that uh, they tend to be uh, pretty tilted or twisted. Uh, and that is to say that their outline is not really well described by convex polytope geometry, which tends to be kind of the abstraction that uh, we default to in, in some of these analyses. So that's a kind of peculiar uh, feature that we can identify in these. And then, uh, so we can move on to the to the comparison itself. So here we have uh, the cell neighbor number uh, and the true cell height measured uh, kind of along the center line of the cell compared to the two populations. And here we can see that differences start to show themselves. So in uh, the first measurement, we can see that the lateral cells tend to have uh, quite a few more neighbors uh, than the medial cells, and this is Kind of matched by a similar uh, distinction in the true cell height. So uh, essentially the structure that we have here is of a, a median hinge point furrow with cells that are shorter and they have fewer neighbors and they are surrounded by this uh, other population of cells that are taller and have more neighbors. And these differences I think clearly kind of line up with uh, the curvature gradients that we saw earlier in the medial ladder direction. And so we can take this analysis a, a, a step further and focus on some of the more subtle uh, distinctions between these two cell populations. Uh, I've included an example here of uh, the distribution of the lateral contact areas compared into two, in the two populations. So uh, to pause here for a second, uh, this is an analysis that uh, isolates a single cell, identifies all its contacts, measures uh, all the contact areas in that cell, orders them by size, and then kind of plots them as a distribution. And again, so here the orange uh, curves uh, show the medial cells and the blue curves show the lateral cells. And uh, the confidence interval that you can see here is from uh, tracking these cells over time and kind of averaging those distributions uh, over extended periods of time. So this is, uh, I think, very striking to me. Uh, first of all, it shows that, uh, again, there's a difference in the number of neighbors between these two populations. But maybe more interestingly, there is also a difference in how their contact areas are distributed. Uh, so in the medial uh, cells, we tend to see uh, a population of very large contacts and then smaller contacts. but Maybe surprisingly, in the uh, lateral cell population, we see uh, kind of a more continuous distribution where contacts of all sizes are represented. So going back to our question, uh, we can use this analysis to kind of tease out these subtle, maybe surprising uh, morphological features uh, in uh, the spinal mouse neuroplate epithelium and then kind of develop that analysis into regional differences and how these morphological features kind of manifest along tissue scale constraints like curvature and heights. And so for uh, the remainder of the talk, I think uh, I would like to share with you uh, the second part of this analysis with, in which we asked uh, how, how did these structures evolve? And here, uh, we were really interested in cell rearrangements uh, because of their involvement in uh, the tissue scale flows, mainly convergent extension. 
So again, I think it's helpful here to pause and really appreciate how uh, dynamic these cells are, uh, even though this deformation takes place over an extended period of time that might be slow, relatively speaking. Uh, over that time scale, these cells are quite dynamic. And their contacts are constantly remodeling, they're constantly uh, rearranging due to fluctuations or other forms of motion. And so um, one of the like uh, more prominent aspects of this tissue that we were interested in were cell rearrangements. So here uh, we have demonstrated a typical uh, T1 process that involves the uh, rearrangement of four neighboring cells. And you know, from 2D analysis, we have this very nice uh, geometric abstraction of this, this process where uh, the bicellular contacts are represented by edges and multicellular contacts are represented by uh, nodes uh, of the cell outline network. And that abstraction uh, allows us to One follow minute this. Left. To, uh, to follow this process in time uh, through the formation of a higher order vertex. So um, I'm gonna have to go quickly over this, but the uh, essential finding that we have here is that we have a, an analog of this in 3D where we can follow this uh, higher order vertex uh, now in the depth di uh, direction as it moves, uh, as it forms on one end of the apical basal axis and traverses the axis to resolve uh, the cell rearrangement. And so again, here we can uh, get time series of the motions of these geometric features, which uh, we can then link to the kinetics of the cell rearrangements. And again, here uh, we see what Williams and colleagues showed earlier, which is that uh, cell rearrangements can start at different uh, positions along the axis and proceed with different kinetics. And so very briefly, I'd like to highlight uh, the collaboration with my colleague in the lab, Erica, where we have been following these kinds of ideas in the fly germ band uh, during uh, Drosophila gastrulation and trying to really tease out how these cell rearrangements uh, start, how they proceed, what are their typical kinetics and how they're linked to uh, cell geometry. Okay, and with that, so, um, Today, I'm hoping to have shared with you interesting aspects about uh, how live imaging and 4D reconstructions can be used to study epithelial morphogenesis. And uh, I've also shown you some kind of surprising and interesting features of the mouse neuroplate epithelium. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, members of the KSA Living Materials Lab for their support and their feedback on this talk. And, uh, also, everyone who contributed to this work. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Sasan, for such a great talk. Um, just a reminder, people can put their questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll address them one by one. But while people are typing their questions, so from what I understand, along the neural epithelium, um, there is a difference in cell division. Like there's a high variability in um, a phospholystone 3 or other dividing cell markers from the center to, from the medial to the lateral side. How do you, um, do, you do you know how the cells divide? Are they still say, staying columnar like that when they're dividing? Because I thought they divide along the apical basal axis. So do you not count those cells if that's the case? No, no, thank you. So this is, uh, I'm very excited for that question because this is an aspect uh, of the system that I find very engaging. So um, yes, I, I think uh, it's accurate to say that uh, the cells divide uh, on the apical plane and then they get reintegrated uh, into the epithelium, which the first time that I saw this, I was uh, kind of blown away. And yeah, so this is uh, this is very much uh, a process that we're hoping to be able to capture uh, with these tools and study the kinetics of. Um, so there are various questions here uh, involving how the local packing structure adapts to these, uh, how it kind of uh, mediates the reintegration of the dividing cell and so on. And 
again, there are also questions to ask about how some morphology evolves uh, during the process, but yeah, very much so, I think he's. So for now, are you not considering the dividing cells in your analyses for looking at cell cell contact and uh, length? So for for the work that I presented today, uh, we haven't necessarily focused on that now, but um, I am hoping to really uh, also include this in in the analysis of the lateral contact remodel. But the the gotcha. the work today was mostly on T ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Jessica Feldman. I was struck by the cell twisting that you observe. Any idea how this twisting develops? Is it due to intercalation movements? Yes, thank you. So this is uh, quite striking indeed. So I think one thing that really stands out to me about the twisting is that uh, it tends to be fairly persistent. So if you follow these cells over time, uh, you can see that these contacts really remain uh, twisted. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, was really interesting to me was how uh, localized the twisting is. So um, in the example that we have here, for, us, for instance, it's pretty localized to the apical part of the cell, which I think really, find pretty intriguing. So um, yeah, that's that's a great question. Like, Are, are they related to... Uh, cell rearrangements, are they related to patterns of uh, tension in the tissue, and so on. Yeah, thank you for that. I was also thinking it'd be very cool to see um, this cell twisting or cell movement differences with your model in um, mutated embryos like sonic hedgehog mutation or something like that, how exactly that changes the shell shape and adhesion with their neighbors. Yes, absolutely. All right, um, we don't have any more questions, so I'll hand it over to Constantinos. Thank you so much, Sassan, for a great seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ankita. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Kalivyotis, and I am a postdoc at the Francis Crick Institute in London. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Light, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Notre Dame, who will present her work on genetic mechanisms shaping peripheral nervous system development. Sarah earned her PhD in neuroscience from The Ohio State University, where her research focused on the developmental roles of delta protocaterines in neural circuit assembly. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience from the University of Vermont, where she began her work in developmental neuroscience, particularly with Zebrafish models. Sarah has been recognized for her contributions with several prestigious awards, including the National Institutes of Health NRSA Fellowship, the Outstanding Postdoctoral Oral Presentation Award at the 2024 Midwest Regional Society for Developmental Biology Meeting, and the Edward J. Ray Travel Award. She has co-authored multiple peer-reviewed publications and has presented her findings at more than 20 national and international conferences, demonstrating her leadership and expertise in the field. Uh, beyond her research, Sarah is also dedicated to teaching and mentorship, having guided numerous undergraduate and graduate students. She also serves as a postdoctoral representative in the Association for Women in Science at Notre Dame, further proving her commitment to fostering equal opportunities for all. She also coordinates a biannual outreach event for her research group that brings preschool children into the lab to encourage interest in science at a young age. With her impressive combination of scientific rigor, passion for mentorship, and dedication to advancing our understanding of neural development, Sarah is an inspiration for sure for all. We are really looking forward to hearing about the recent advances in your work, Sarah. So the stage is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Constantinos, for that lovely and generous um, introduction. Share my screen. Okay, great. 
Um, so hi, everyone. I'm so excited to have the opportunity um, to talk to you today about a project I've been working on for the last couple of years um, at the University of Notre Dame in Cody Smith's lab. Um, so to begin, I would like to draw your attention to the peripheral nervous system. Um, and uh, for anyone who might not know, your peripheral nervous system is um, everything outside of your brain and your spinal cord in your nervous system. And even if you're not a neuroscientist, you might have sort of a basic understanding that your per peripheral nervous system is really important for your brain to be able to talk to other parts of your body, to bring sensory information in and carry motor commands out. Um, and But another function of your PNS that might not come to mind as readily is that it also allows your nervous system to be able to talk to and control um, your organs, limbs, and skin in your periphery. And in making these connections, it's able to regulate involuntary bodily functions like your heart rate and breathing, something that we're all doing all the time, although we might not be consciously aware of it. Um, so this peripheral control of organ function is really important at rest to maintain homeostasis throughout the body. And you can see here in the schematic some examples of different organs that are contacted by your peripheral nervous system. Um, however, it's also very critical in situations when you might need to rapidly respond to a stimulus. So for example, if a lion were to suddenly appear in this room that you were sitting in, you would hope uh, that your peripheral nervous system would contact your heart and your muscles to get you ready to um, run away from that threat very quickly. Um, and some of the neuronal circuitry of these innervations of organs have been mapped um, like in this example published somewhat recently of um, the uh, neuronal circuitry of the, the rat, um, the rat heart. Um, and this, these kinds of studies highlight the complexity of these different um, sort of mini brains found within these organs. But so sort of an open question in the field is whether these, um, these circuits also contain um, glial cells. So for anyone who might not know what glial cells are, um, they're basically everything in your nervous system that is not the neurons themselves. So in this schematic here, um, I'm highlighting the three different glial cell types that you find in the central nervous system, which are microglia, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. Um, and I don't have time to go into all of the different um, functional roles that these cell cells play, but suffice it to say that they're very important um, for your nervous system to be able to develop and function correctly. Um, and then in thinking about the periphery, there are two sort of canonical cell types that you'll see described in, um, in textbooks and in reviews of the peripheral nervous system. And those are the satellite glial cells, which you'll find in different ganglion throughout the, the periphery. And then also these Schwann cells, which provide myelin wrapping around axons. Now, in addition to these satellite glia and Schwann cells, evidence has been steadily accumulating that glia may also be found um, within the organs of your body, which makes a lot of sense um, considering all of the really important roles that glia play um, elsewhere in your nervous system and in regulating neuronal function. So enteric glia of the gastrointestinal system are sort of the most famous, the most well-studied of these different cell types. Um, but over the past decade or so, there has been many reports of different glial cell populations found in other or organs. For example, the lung, the spleen, the pancreas, and the heart. Um, and our research group published a paper a few years ago looking at this particular population of glial cells in the heart um, and their role in regulating the, the development and also the function of this organ. Um, so before I go too far, you're going to hear me use this abbreviation CNG throughout the talk. Um, so this is um, just representing of cardiac nexus glia, which is what we named um, this cell population. Um, and all of our um, this previous work identified that this population is conserved without throughout vertebrate species, um, but all of our work is um, done in zebrafish. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to orient you to what the zebrafish heart looks like and what you might see in some of my images throughout my talk. Um, so here in this schematic, we're looking at the zebrafish from um, the bottom side, the ventral side. And if we zoom in on the heart tissue here, um, we can see that the heart has just two ventricles and the blood flows unidirectionally. So it goes into um, 
the posterior of the heart into the atrium first, which is colored pink here, and then through into the ventricle colored here in green, and then out the anterior um, outflow tract. Um, and so to be able to study these cells in the heart, um, I developed a new transgenic line, um, which labels the, the nuclei of these cells and, in green and the membrane in red, and they're driven by this GFAP um, promoter. So GFAP is a well-known um, glial cell marker. And so when we look in the hearts of these transgenics, we see something like this. Um, where hopefully you can see here in this um, panel on the right, all of these individual nuclei labeled in green here um, in the ventricle. Um, and we can really easily count these cells because of this nuclear label. And if we do that and we look um, over time, we can see that this population expands pretty dramatically in early larval development between two and four days and then kind of levels off a little bit. And at each of these time points that I looked at within this first developmental week, um, the majority of cells that we can see um, are found in the ventricle, which is represented by the green portion of each of these stacked bars here. So um, we first wanted to establish whether the cells that we were seeing in the heart really represented a mature and stable cell population. And one way to do this is that we used a mosaic labeling approach um, where we can identify and track single cells over time. So here's an example of what this looks like, where in this top panel here, I've, um, I'm pointing to the same cell um, that I'm able to image um, at three, four, and five days. Um, and you can see that it maintains a very consistent position in the tissue despite the heart itself changing shape and, and growing in this time period. And then if I measure the domain of this cell, so the area that it's occupying within um, the ventricle here, um, we can also see that that number also remains very consistent over time. Um, so the positionality and the, the shape of the cell is not changing too much once it's there. And additionally, in time lapses that I've done of the hearts of these animals, um, I almost never see any cell division. So suggesting to us that this GFAP population is, is mature and is um, no longer mitotically active. Now, the heart is a very unique tissue to work with um, because it is constantly moving. Um, so like in this example that you see here, um, in the zebrafish larva, the heart begins to beat at around 22 hours um, post-fertilization. And so we were curious if this mechanical move might, might actually be instructive for the development of these cells. Um, and so thankfully, the zebrafish model is sort of uniquely suited um, to be able to answer this question because we can use different genetic and pharmacological manipulations to actually stop the heartbeat and then um, see what effect that has. Um, do not try this at home with your mammalian models. Um, so in this example here, we're using a drug called BDM, which is a myosin inhibitor. And when we expose our animals to this drug, um, here in the blue line are the treated animals. You can see that the heartbeat comes down pretty rapidly and stays down at essentially zero while they're in the drug. And then when I remove the drug here at this um, dashed line, um, the heartbeat recovers pretty rapidly and there's no uh, detrimental effects on um, the survival or health of these animals. And so we can compare um, the cell population in animals that have been treated with the drug as well as those that had never been exposed to the drug. And we see that there's no difference in the number of cells that I see in the heart, um, suggesting to us that at least um, for the abundance of these, um, of these cells in the heart, that the mechanical movement itself um, is indispensable, is, sorry, is dispensable. Okay, so I don't have time to share all of my primary data with you, so I'm just going to take a minute here to kind of summarize a lot of experiments and tell you what we already know about this cell population. Um, so we already know that they express um, GFAP, this sort of canonical glial marker that I mentioned a little bit ago. Um, the data that I just showed you um, identified that they don't seem to rely on the mechanical movement of their resident tissue for their expansion and establishment of the population. From previous work, we knew that this population originates from the neural crest, um, which is uh, expressing SOX10 very early in development. And then once in the heart, nexus glia quickly turn on GFAP and turn off SOX10. 
Um, the nexus glia can be found in the heart very early in development and the population expands dramatically between two and four days. Um, and also nexus glia have a very low prolifer proliferative rate and are very stable over time, both in terms of their location and morphology. So rather than this direct um, production of nexus glia from SOX10 neural crest, all of this data together kind of suggests an alternate theory that we might actually have sort of an intermediate progenitor population that is proliferating and then goes on to produce these GFAT positive um, nexus glia. So all of this kind of leaves us with this very big open question about what are the genetic mechanisms that are driving nexus glia differentiation and um, what genes might potentially be expressed in this intermediate progenitor population. So to answer this question, we undertook a large scale um, genetic screen using a CRISPR-Cas9 um, knockdown approach. So um, we went to this previously existing single cell sequencing data set that was published a handful of years ago, um, looking at embryonic human heart tissue. And we identified 89 target genes that we are interested in looking at. And for each of these target genes, we designed um, a pool of three to four guide RNAs and injected those along with the Cas9 enzyme into one cell stage zebrafish embryos, and then grew these animals up and then image their hearts on our confocal at four days. And we were able to do this in a very high throughput way um, because we have this lovely um, automated robot imaging system in our lab, which allows us to um, load animals in a 96 well plate. And then the, um, the microscope will individually image and keep track of each animal. And so that produces um, many beautiful images of the heart like this one that I showed you earlier. And then we can go in um, after imaging and we can quantify um, the cells and look for any phenotypes. Okay, so um, like I mentioned, we had 89 target genes, which is a lot of data. Um, so I'm just gonna provide you some examples and kind of summarize what we, what we found here. Um, so on the left here, I have some representative examples of data from this screen. Um, so we have our scrambled guide RNA over here on the, the most left, which is our control. And then hopefully you can see in some of these examples that we have some pretty dramatic differences in the number of cells that we see here. Um, what I, the area that I've outlined here is the ventricle. And then on the right here, um, rather than showing you a bar graph with 90 bars on it, um, which nobody wants to look at, including me, um, we have this, um, this other way to represent our data that's a little bit more digestible. So in this graph here, uh, every single dot uh, plotted here is the, um, the number of cells seen in a particular gene knockdown minus the number seen in our scrambled control. So essentially anything that is above uh, this dotted line at zero has more cells like these examples on the top here and anything below this line had fewer cells like these examples here. And then in the graph, anything that's colored either blue or red are those that are statistically significant. And I'm just gonna draw your attention to one gene here in particular, Cadherin 6, which I'm gonna talk about for a few more minutes. Um, so we wanted to verify that cadherin 6 can actually be found in the developing heart. And so to do that, we turned to um, a single cell sequencing data set that was actually just published this year. Um, so this is a different data set than the one that we initially got our, our, our screen targets from. Um, and if we look at the expression of cadherin 6 across the different clusters in this data set, um, these darker areas are indicating levels of high expression. Um, and you can hopefully see that there's a very high expression, not exclusively, but um, pretty confined to this neuronal cluster in this data set, which is exactly where we would expect um, our nexus glia to be found. Um, and then we've also started to do some follow-up follow experiments on this cadherin 6 gene in particular. And this is work um, that I've done in collaboration with um, a wonderful and very talented undergrad in our lab, Natalia. So using some independently generated um, new knockdown reagents, we were able to re recapitulate and validate the original phenotype that we saw in the screen, which is an increase in the number of GFAT positive cells that we see at four days. And additionally, um, we've also looked at an earlier time point and we see this same um, expansion in the population. 
Um, and we're still working on figuring out when and how this expansion is actually occurring to underlie this phenotype. And additionally, Natalia has also um, gathered some data on the heart rate of these animals, and she's able to correlate that data with um, the cell quantifications shown in the graph on the left. And we see these, um, this interesting phenotype here where in our Cadherin-6 uh, crispins, he's shown here in this green line, that we have this interesting trend where um, the more cells that are found in the heart, the lower the heart rate seems to be. So this set up this, um, this very interesting question about whether or not nexus glia might have a physiological role in, in the heart um, and whether they might be physiologically active. So to answer this question, um, we developed this genetically encoded calcium indicator transgenic line. Um, so calcium can be um, sort of a proxy measure of physiological activity in different populations. And when we image these cells um, or these um, animals, we can see this very interesting sort of rhythmic bursting activity of, um, of calcium transients over time over this, this movie. And something I wanna point out here is that um, here you're just seeing the ventricle light up, um, but you can see that all of the cells that are labeled here are kind of flashing all together, which suggests that they're maybe um, forming this physiological network in the tissue. Okay, and then if you um, plot this activity over time, um, we're looking at the activity of the GFAT positive nexus glia here in this green line here, and you can see this really nice sort of very consistent rhythmic activity that I mentioned. Um, and then if you compare this and overlay it with the activity of the cardiomyocytes, the muscle cells of the heart, um, which are shown here in this pink line, you can see that they're very well correlated with each other. But then if you zoom in, it appears that they might have some, some subtle temporal um, differences in what their activity profiles look like. So, so this suggests that there's a functional relationship between these, two, um, between these two populations, which is something that we're very interested in following up on. Um, so we also wanted to know whether the knockdown of cadherin-6 might have any impact on, on this calcium activity profile that we see. Um, so the, the data that I just showed you was just plotting sort of raw fluorescence changes, um, but another way that you can look at this type of data is to plot what's called a z-score. So a z-score is basically just a measure of how different the fluorescence intensity is at any one time point compared to the average fluorescence across the entirety of the movie. Um, so if you plot this, it looks very similar to the, the raw fluorescence where you get these, um, these rhythmic peaks of activity, which I've indicated each of these in this particular example um, here with these pink arrows. And you can set um, a threshold. In this example, we've chosen a threshold here of two, and then that allows you to isolate just these sort of time points when the activity is peaking above this threshold. And so when I um, collect movies of my animals and I, and I do this type of analysis, this is what I see, um, that the number of spikes in um, a short movie that I see is um, although there's a decreasing trend here, um, there's no difference between my animals that are uninjected and my animals that are injected with, with my cadherin-6 knockdown reagents. However, if I look at these individual spikes, I see that there is um, a statistically, statistically significant increase in the duration of these spikes. So for each of them, the average number of time points that that spike represents is increased. So this is suggesting um, that perhaps there's not, um, we're losing a little bit of that really tight temporal uh, correlation of this network activity and each spike takes longer um, to resolve in the tissue. Okay, so now I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to summarize what I've told you and add on some pieces of data to that working model of nexus glia development that I introduced to you earlier. Um, so this is what we already knew and a potential um, progenitor population that we suspected might exist. Um, we now also know that nexus glia are physiologically active and they have these rhythmic calcium transients um, within the tissue. And we also know that if we perturb cadherin-6, um, we can alter the population dynamics uh, of these cells and also their, um, their rhythmic ne network activity. 
Um, so our big remaining questions are how exactly are nexus glia regulating heart function and, and what's their functional relationship with the cardiomyocytes of the heart? And then also what is the mechanism by which cadherin-6 is, is directing this developmental trajectory? Are they maybe expressed in this progenitor population or maybe driving them towards a, a particular fate? Um, and so we're obviously very interested in this particular population that our lab um, sort of discovered a few years ago, um, but sort of in the bigger picture of this, we we're, we're also have this larger goal of really expanding the field's understanding of peripheral glia, so where they are, what do they do, how important are they, so to sort of add on to um, not just having these satellite cells and Schwann cells, but also potentially recognizing that there might be other glial populations and different organs throughout the body. Um, and we're hoping that eventually this is going to lead to a better understanding of how your peripheral nervous system is able to regulate all of these bodily functions and make sure that you're um, maintaining homeostasis. Okay, so I'm just gonna take one more minute and just um, acknowledge um, both my funding sources, in particular my um, F32 fellowship from the NIH, um, as well as all of my coworkers and lab friends um, who are um, you know, fantastic people to come in and work with um, every day. And in particular, I wanna highlight these people, um, many of whom are undergrads, and they were really the ones who, um, who really got the screen going. Um, without their help, it would have taken me many more months than it did. So I'm very grateful um, for everything that they contributed. And thank you all so much for your attention. And I am happy to take um, any questions that you might have. Thank you so much uh, for this really wonderful talk. And uh, let's see, we don't really have any questions right now in the, in the Q&A box, but uh, I would maybe start first, I would like to ask you, because you saw that there is, you know, when you have more cells, more CNG cells, then this actually changes the heartbeat. And this is something very, very interesting. And I was thinking whether you have any ideas how this actually changed also the, the volume of the blood that is actually pumped out of the heart. Hmm. That's a very interesting question. We have never really tried to measure that in any way. Um, I, I know that that's potentially something we could do if we maybe got our, you know, engineering and sort of mathematical colleagues, um, involved in this project. Um, I would imagine that, I don't know about the volume, but maybe like the velocity of blood flow could potentially be changed, obviously by having, you know, more beats per minute. Um, something else that we're also sort of interested in and just kind of haven't gotten to yet is looking at whether um, any changes sort of in baseline might also impact how the system is responding to like stress. So if we, you know, sort of challenge the autonomic nervous system, what then happens to the heart if you don't have the correct number of cells in that tissue? Yeah. It makes sense because I was thinking more about, you know, the shear stress forces and how this actually would change because if you have more cells and then the heartbeat is different, probably also mm -hmm. this would stress forces and probably maybe even the endothelial cell development. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, something else that I would like to ask is, give me one sec. Yeah, is actually whether because you saw that you you did the BDM treatments and I thought have you uh, tried probably uh, the silent heart mutants to see whether you see similar results? Yes, actually. So when I said you know genetic ways to manipulate, that's exactly what I was referring to was the silent heart. So that was my original idea for this project was to use um, silent heart um, CRISPR reagents to to knock down. Um, knock down the heartbeat basically from the beginning because the the drug is a little bit different and that's sort of like a temporary stopping of the heart. Whereas in the silent hearts, if you have a good knockdown, they never develop a heartbeat to begin with. So I have compared those two and I see the same thing um, when I when I use the silent heart approach. Um, it just it because they don't have a heartbeat. Um, they live, but you know, that kind of, you know, they get edema and the heart doesn't look as good. So it's really hard to compare like uninjected animals to injected animals because they're not really the same thing. 
Um, so that's kind of why we shifted toward using the drug as a little bit more of a, a gentler approach to be able to answer the same type of question and do all of our, our imaging. And it makes it a little bit easier if I don't have to inject every single time I want to run an experiment. Makes sense. Uh, there is actually one question from uh, Anne Sutherland. Have you looked at the effects later on in the adults? Do the effects change? Yeah, I have not. Um, our The previous grad student who worked on this project did a little bit of work looking at this population in the adult, but it was mainly just to sort of see, you know, do those cells persist into adulthood? What did they kind of look like in the adult tissue? Um, she really didn't do any um, any functional assays at later time points, and I've um, been pretty focused on this um, early developmental window, so I really haven't looked um, in the adult. Makes sense. Uh, uh, let's see, no, there's no other question. I have one more question. Sure. It's, it's actually about the, the functional imaging because it was really impressive to see all this actual synchronization of the calcium responses. Mm -hmm. And I was actually wondering, is there any physical connection between the CNGs or is it, do you believe it's because of the contraction of, of the, the uh, yeah so this is a question that we get a lot um and uh unfortunately i don't have a good answer for you right now i suspect that these cells might be physically functionally connected with gap junctions however the the tricky part about trying to determine whether that is the case is Connexin 43 is the gap junction that we would suspect they're most likely to have. Um, and unfortunately, that's the same gap junction that exists between the cardiomyocytes. So it would be very difficult for us to do imaging where we can really tease out whether those gap junctions are between two nexus glia versus like a nexus glia and a cardiomyocyte or two cardiomyocytes. So we are um, planning to do some experiments with like gap junction blockers and just see if that changes the activity profiles of the nexus glia and also the cardiomyocytes. But it's a little bit just because of the structure of the tissue and how closely related those two populations are. It's a little bit of a, a technically challenging question to answer. Yeah, makes sense. And one more last question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually, do you have any other interesting genes that you're actually uh, hoping to <laughs> add later on? Yeah, so the, the other one that's sort of next up on the list, um, which I haven't really started to do anything with, is this um, ADNRB, which is the endothelin receptor. And we have um, a colleague kind of down the hall from us who, um, who worked on that a lot in her postdoc, and she has her own um, lab now. And so we're um, if we do get into that, we're hoping to kind of collaborate with her a little bit to figure out what might be going on. And that receptor ligand pair has known roles in other glial populations, but we really kind of don't know what that might be doing in, in our population in particular. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, and Sarah, for the wonderful talk and the nice Q&A session. And... Um, uh, now, thank you, Sas and Char, both uh, for your excellent talks. Uh, this seminar has been recorded and uh, will be available on the SDB website next week. Uh, please join us for next month's seminar on Friday, October 11th, when Leah Greenspan from NIH and Ben Cox from University of California, Davis, will present. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>